For the interest of time, I will shorten my presentation so we have some time in the end for, for the discussion. And uh, so um, I would like to discuss integrating biomarkers into care because I think it's very important. We are not treating biomarkers or lab results, we are treating patients. So the biomarkers that we had to deal with and decide upon where we see the patient, patient for the first time is, of course, the histopathology and tumor biology that we have heard a lot of from Dr. Klöppel, and then circulating markers, which I will be alluding on mainly, and then also some markers for response evaluation. And I put on a new concept on circulating tumor cells because that is in, of interest in other diseases, other cancers such as breast and colorectal but has not been explored in, in uh, neuroendocrine tumors. And then, don't forget to use molecular imaging also as a biomarker. So I will very quickly move forward. I, I just want to point out that uh, we have been working with WHO classification, the old one, so now we have to reconsider the new one, but based on, on this uh, classification, yeah, and also the proliferation ki 67 levels we have based our medical treatment and also discussions in the surgical team, as you heard from Dr. Falcone. So uh, it's a clear difference uh, in survival for the different subgroups. Uh, but of course, now we have to consider the new classification system and see if we can regroup our patients. We have also uh, something to take into consideration. These uh, tumors express a lot of, a lot of receptors. And uh, actually, the only ones that have been quite significantly explored are the somatostatin receptors. But we have a lot of other uh, hormone receptors. We have dopamine receptors. We have interferon receptors. And we have growth factor receptors. If you look at uh, somatostatin receptors, I think you must be aware of that uh, each patient, each individual can express different subtypes of somatostatin receptors, and that might be important in the future when we start to look into new subtype-specific somatostatin analogs or pan-receptor analogs. And these are two cases of pancreatic nets. And as you can see from this, data that uh, case one is expressing receptor type one, two, and uh, four, but not three and five, whereas the other one is not expressing any one, receptor two re and receptor four and weekly receptor five. So you can get a panel of receptor expression if you start to do it more routinely. And nowadays there are available antibodies to buy for, for staining of somatostatin receptors. And this is a study from some centers indicating, of course, the previous well-known that uh, most of these neuroendocrine tumors express somatostatin type 2 receptors, but there are also other receptors expressed, which is quite important. So also studies indicating that we have um, dopamine receptors in our neuroendocrine tumors, and uh, that uh, Ibsen tried to develop a new compound, a chimeric molecule, binding to both somatostatin type 2 receptor and dopamine 2 receptor. Unfortunately, the development of this drug is now stopped. But um, I think maybe in the future we might see some new drugs coming that can, because these receptors are not only uh, uh, expressed as um, homodimers, they are mostly expressed as heterodimers, combined receptor type 2 with D2 receptors and so forth, receptor type 2 with somatostatin receptor type 5. So this is a whole new area that uh, we had to look into and also understand the signaling through the different receptors. We did a study several years ago now on growth factor and growth factor exp uh, receptor expression. And ac actually, almost every well-known uh, receptor, uh, growth factor uh, receptor and growth factor are expressed both on the tumor cells and the stroma cells. So that is also an area which had been 
debated because there have not been a clear correlation between the expression of a res certain receptor and the response. So coming to biomarkers, and uh, as you have already heard in previous speaks, that um, uh, uh, these uh, tumors express a lot of peptides and amines, and uh, it depends on how big uh, your budget is, uh, how many of these uh, agents you want to analyze. And these are just uh, a summary of uh, all the different uh, uh, agents that can be analyzed from, from neuroendocrine tumor patients. And uh, I would like to concentrate on chromogranin A, and uh, there was also a question coming up about how to use it. But as you can see, we, for a mid-gut carcinoid tumor, we can analyze, of course, urinary 5-HIA, 5-HT. Uh, we can uh, analyze um, substance P and other tachykinins. And for the other ones, we can also analyzed a lot of different uh, uh, substances like uh, bradykinins, catecholamines, uh, HEG subunits, and so forth. So uh, we had to, to reduce the number of analyzers, otherwise we, we, we have not the budget for, for, for analyzing it. So why should we select chromogranin A? The chromogranins is a large family of glycoproteins, and at our center we analyze chromogranin A and chromogranin B, and uh, there are some centers also looking at 7B2. I know particular at Hammersmith they have been uh, working a little bit with that. NESP55 is only explored in histopathology. If you look at the chromogranin A molecule, it contains 439 amino acids, and uh, it's spliced off in smaller fragments. And uh, there are these, a lot of different fragments that we actually try to analyze. We developed uh, uh, specific uh, antibodies to the different, uh, to 12 different fragments but when we started to analyze it and compare to analyzing the complete chromogranin A molecule, we couldn't see any advantage of all these smaller fragments. And in some polydifferentiated tumors, the enzymes necessary to cleave off the smaller fragments are not there. Looking at chromogranin A and chromogranin B, both assays are quite sensitive. Unfortunately, chromogranin B is not available at all centers. But you can find them uh, increased in uh, all different subtypes of, of um, neuroendocrine tumors compared to healthy controls. If you look at uh, chromogranin A peptides again, there is also a correlation with uh, tumor mass. So the larger tumor mass, you have the higher circulating levels. And uh, that is important to realize during treatment that in some instances, when you use somatostatin analogs, the correlation between tumor mass and the circulating chromogranin A levels are not there. Because what you're doing with somatostatin analogs, you are blocking the release of the peptide without necessarily decreasing the, the size of the tumor. We have already heard that uh, there is a correlation between chromogranin A levels and uh, survival. And this is another study from uh, Holland uh, indicating that uh, if you have different cutoff levels, you see also uh, different survival. And this is in, in, uh, done in the mid-gut carcinoid tumors. Another interesting observation which was done in the study by James Yao in the Radiant 1 trial was that if you looked at the response in chromogranin A as well as neuron-specific analase, uh, if you had an early response, you had a longer, significantly longer PFS compared to, to those with a late or absent uh, response in chromogranin A. So for the first time, you can also predict 
a response from uh, measuring chromogranin A during a trial or when you treat the patient. I have not been talking about NSE because some centers like it, and I think it might be useful in poorly differentiated tumors. But uh, from my point of view, it's a more non-specific NLAs than a neurospecific NLAs. So uh, we have stopped to use it, but I know that there are centers that like to do it. You must also realize that um, chromogranin A, you have some other conditions that cause falsely elevated levels, such as chronic atrophic gastritis, inflammatory bowel disease, and impaired kidney function. So you must always evaluate the levels uh, according to the current clinical situation. Another thing uh, I will, which I will br bring up already at this stage is that I don't think it's a screening marker for diffuse symptoms in a patient coming. I think you should have a certain suspicion of a neuroendocrine tumor or a patient coming back several times with diffuse GI tract symptoms, then you can, can do the chromogranin A as a, as a screening. But you must be aware of the false positives such as chronic atrophic gastritis and, and inflammatory bowel disease. I just want to show you some new things. And this is um, uh, some recent data we published in PLOS One. Uh, and uh, that is a new antigen, paraneoplastic antigen, MA2, done in uh, small intestine neuroendocrine tumors, midgut tumors. And when we look at the cutoff level of 2,000 units, we could correlate this uh, to, uh, 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 to survival as well as uh, progression-free survival. And, uh, Below the cutoff level, uh, the, the survival and PFS was significantly longer than for those above the cutoff level. And uh, this was done in a material of uh, 130 patients resected by the surgeons, considered to be uh, cured by the surgery. So, uh, and we follow these patients uh, prospectively, and we, we could demonstrate that this uh, new antibody can maybe detect earlier than radiology uh, a recurrence of the disease. I talked previously on MGMT. I think it's an interesting marker to use for uh, de determining if you should use temozolomide in a patient or not. I think it's too early to completely use it as a, as a definite marker, but it's so interesting, I think we have to explore it more. And you have already seen this data. Another interesting observation is done by Dr. Scarpa's group, and that is for the mTOR signaling pathway. We also have some uh, interesting markers that can be analyzed. And one is, of course, the tuberous sclerosis II protein expression. And in those patients with low levels of uh, tuberous sclerosis protein had a significantly lower survival and progression-free survival than those with higher levels of, of the protein. They also analyzed the P10 protein and um, Again, a low level of the P10 is uh, related to a worse prognosis than a, a high level. So we might be able to start to use new markers, and uh, we have, of course, to develop these further on and look into larger clinical materials. We have heard about molecular imaging. I will not give you the details, but I just want to show you a patient. I said that you should include all the different techniques into your decision of a patient. This was a patient that was considered to be cured after surgery and uh, should be left for just follow-up. Uh, but we were a little bit suspicious because one thing was that the PNMA2 
level was high. And uh, this was a mid-gut carcinoid tumor. And so we did this value of HDP PET. And uh, to our surprise, you saw this uh, uh, metastasis in the bone. And of course, that completely changed the management of this tumor and, uh, and this patient. So you have to integrate all the possible knowledge in the follow-up and care of your patient. And this has already been shown by Anders, this patient where uh, on CT scan the, the lymph node was missed uh, on CT scan but could be picked up by the 5-HTP PET. And uh, you have already heard that using FTG PET, this excellent uh, uh, study from, from uh, Copenhagen uh, showing that if you have a FTG positive uh, tumor, you have a worse prognosis than an FTG PET negative. And they also could uh, clarify that more in detail by looking at different standard uptake take values. So for the future directions in this area, there is a need for new biomarkers. We had to work on that particularly for early detection and also monitoring response to treatment. And there are new techniques coming now that are av available. For example, pro proximity lig ligation assays, high resolution mass spectrometry for proteins. And of course, these are laborious techniques to begin with, but they can be more standardized uh, in the near future. And, uh, being used as uh, ready-to-use assays. We had to explore circulating tumor cells, and uh, that is, uh, I, was, I know, a program that is ongoing in London. Uh, Martin Kaplan's group is uh, starting to look into circulating tumor cells. And then molecular imaging. It must be developed further. I mean, here we have uh, really something to work on. And uh, I mean, it's more a matter of money and, and people to develop new tracers that can be of value to evaluate proliferation, apoptosis, and uh, angiogenesis. So by that, I stop and thank you for your attention.